Hello, it's Scott Manley here with a, a little educational video here. Actually, this is all about orbital mechanics, and I'm going to try and explain it with a pen and paper because I keep talking about these things and alluding to these equations and calculations I have performed, but uh, I never actually explain them. So if we imagine this as a typical orbit, right, you have an apoapse and you have a periapse. We're going to call this R1 for the apoapse and R2 for the periapse. It doesn't actually matter. Now, I've mentioned the term semi-major axis. The semi-major axis of, this is an ellipse, right? And, and unlike a circle, right, which has the same radius all the way around, an ellipse has a different radius as it goes around. So it has two major axes, or it has two axes. It has the minor axis in this direction, which is shorter, and the major axis, which is longer in this direction. So the semi-major axis is half the length of this distance, or to put it another way, it's the average of R1 and R2. So let's write A, which is actually the term they use. The average is equal to R1 plus R2 over 2. So this is an important thing. This, this value A is probably the most important value in uh, orbital mechanics. It turns up everywhere in almost every equation, and it is simply the average of your periapse versus your apoapse. And let me just clarify, if you imagine that you have a planet here, right, you may be measuring your altitude relative to the planet, but actually it's your distance from the center that matters. So if you're 100 kilometers over Kerbin in Kerbal Space Program, you are actually 700 kilometers above the center, right? Uh, orbital manic mechanics reduces everything to point masses for this, and uh, it certainly makes things a lot simpler. Okay, so the question we want to ask is, if given that we're here in an orbit, for example, right, a distance r, what is the velocity that we have around the center? And there's actually an equation for that, a very, very simple equation that you're going to need everywhere. It says that v squared velocity is equal to g m times 2 over r, which is the distance you're currently at, minus 1 over a, the semi-major axis. So the two values here that you might be wondering around about, g is a physical constant. It's the universal constant of gravitation, and it is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. m is the mass of the central orbit object. Now, let's actually use Earth. The mass of Earth is about 6, or it's about 5.97. Let's do two, two decimal places. 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. So you multiply these together, and what this actually tells you is the acceleration due to gravity if the Earth was a point mass and you were at one meter from the surface. That would be uh, approximately 4 times 10 to the 14 meters per second per, spec per second. Now, uh, frequently, a lot of the equations will take gm and reduce it to a value called mu, which is, of course, for the Earth, as I said, it's about... 4 times 10 to the 14, right? It's a pretty pretty big number, but uh, it's a nice, easy number to carry around. You don't need to write GM everywhere. Okay, so let's apply this to a real-world problem. Actually, let, let's start out with a simple, a simple observation. Do you see this here? What happens when R is equal to A, right? What happens when you have a an object which is in a circular orbit and A is equal to R at all times. Well, of course, 1 and 2, this becomes this becomes V squared is equal to mu times 1 over A. It like becomes incredibly simple. And using that, of course, lets you figure out the exact velocities for circular orbits very simply, right? So Say we plug the values in for an Earth orbit 300 kilometers above the surface. Now, 300 kilometers above the Earth's surface is actually 6,678, right? So let's say R equals A equals 6.678 times 10 to the 6 meters, right? Mu is equal to that. That means that V is equal to, 
and this is, we take the square root obviously, v is equal to 7724 meters per second. Uh, meters per second. And all you do, you're taking mu, right, like 6, or sorry, you're taking mu 10 to the minus, 10, 4 times 10 to the 14, you're dividing it by this value, and then you're taking the square root, and you get this number. That's beautiful. That is the orbital velocity of something in orbit around the Earth. Okay, so now let's try an elliptical orbit. For an elliptical orbit, this no longer holds, right? Let's imagine we are taking an elliptical orbit where we are going to geostationary orbit, right? Geostationary orbit is approximately... Um, 42,164 meters up. So that that's let's uh, move this down and we'll calculate our a. So um, r1 for a geo or geostationary orbit, uh, a geostationary transfer orbit will be 4.2164 times 10 to the 7 and r to the periapsis is, of course, equal to this one here, 6.678 times 10 to the 4. Okay, now 10 to the 6. And that means that A is equal to the average of these, which is, of course, um, 24,000, or 2.4, 20, 2 24,000 kilometers, 4 to 1 times 10 to the 7. So given these numbers, we can calculate our velocity at periapse and at apia, apoapse, right? So v uh, at v squared at p, or v velocity at periapse is equal to um, square root mu times 1 over uh, 6.678, you know, times 10 to the 6 minus, or sorry, 2, 1 over 2.44 times 10 to the 7. And of course, if you throw these numbers in, I've already done this because I don't want to spend forever. It tells us that you have to be moving it 10, 4, 1, 9, 10 kilometers per second to actually get into, to go from a 300 kilometer orbit all the way up to a geostationary orbit, right? Similarly, the velocity at apoapse turns out to be 1607. Very simple, 1607 meters per second. Now, this is a, an interesting thing here. If you've got this value, right, and we've got this value here, we know that if you want to transfer to geostationary orbit, you have to go from this velocity to this velocity, right, which is about... Um, uh, <laughs> it's about uh, two, it's almost three kilometers per second, and this is where I actually have to go and look up my numbers. Yes, yeah, so to actually transfer up to that, it's uh, 2425, 25 meters per second. And that is your delta V. That is how much speed you have to change to actually transfer into a geostationary transfer orbit, right? Uh, no. Once you get to that orbit, you want to circularize, right? So you want to circularize back to your geostationary orbit. Of course, we can do the same values here, except this time A becomes your geostationary velocity, and that means that V at geo is equal to, um, the V at geo is equal to 3074 meters per second. So to actually get into geostationary orbit, you have to go from this speed to this speed, Right, which is 1703 meters per second. Right, so that's delta V dV. So you can add these two numbers, add this number, 1703, and you can add this number, and you can get the total delta V as 4129. And that is us calculated the delta V to get into a geostationary orbit from an equatorial orbit around the planet Earth. And we'll go into a little more detail on this in the next episode. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.
Okay, so there was a bit of a mistake, which I rather embarrassingly noticed after the fact. What happened is something of episode two crept into episode one that I wasn't intending. So first, a number of people noticed that if you take, I said the final delta V needed to go from a 300 kilometer orbit into a geostationary orbit was 4129. And that was achieved by summing 2425 and uh, 1703. Now, immediately you notice that 5 plus 3 is equal to 8, so 4129 is wrong. But the reason for that is that uh, this number was created in a spreadsheet, this number was created in a spreadsheet, and so was this. And there are actually significant figures off to the edge. I've, re I've rounded these down, or rounded these off, and uh, it just so happens that when you do the c computation correctly, then they, it does actually end up as rounding off to 4129. So that is actually correct. It's just because it's a rounding error and you shouldn't get too concerned about it. However, what should have been concerning you was that I said that at Apoapse in our transfer orbit, we would be moving at 1607. And to get into a geostationary orbit, we would have to get up to 304, 3074. And I said that would take 1703. And that's actually completely bogus because if you subtract uh, 1607 from 3074, you get, and I'm moving the camera down, 1466. So dv for the injection into um, geostation orbit is 1466, oh actually 0.5, so it's 1467. Let's make sure the rounding is correct. Which means 1467 plus uh, 2425 is of course 3892. So total is 3892. Now, how did I fail this very simple subtraction? And the reason is I was using a spreadsheet which was actually for which actually accounted for inclination changes. So I intended for part two to actually talk about how uh, you handle inclination changes on getting into geostationary orbit. Uh, and that specifically leads into the people that have been asking me why the TICOM satellite went into an intermediate orbit. And that will be in the next episode, and it will be explained. Suffice to say that this 1703 is the injection with a 22.5 degree plane change added into it. That is why... It is, uh, it is higher than 1467 because you need an extra few hundred, you know, an extra couple of hundred meters per second to uh, convert the uh, inclination back to where it is. So, once again, fly safe.